This video will discuss wave particle duality and the de Broglie wavelength. So Einstein in 1906 with the photoelectric effect described light as both a particle and a wave. So there are some ways in which it has wave-like properties. It has a wavelength, it has a frequency, but some ways in which it behaves like a particle. It has a discrete energy. There's individual quanta of light, individual light particles called photons. So in 1924, de Broglie had kind of the inverse idea that matter if, can be both a particle and a wave as well, that <clears throat> matter is something that can have a wavelength. So we needed to define what this wavelength would be. So the wavelength lambda would be equal to, under his hypothesis, the de Broglie hypothesis, Planck's constant divided by the momentum of the particle which would be Planck's constant divided by mass times velocity for things that have a finite rest mass. Okay, so what does this mean for the properties of particles, for regular matter particles? So if they have a large mass, then this mass is going to be very, very big. This momentum is going to be very, very big compared to Planck's constant. And if this momentum is enormously large compared to Planck's constant, then this wavelength is very, very small. This wavelength is almost zero, and it has basically no effect on the properties of the particle. But as you get to smaller and smaller mass, smaller and smaller objects, lighter and lighter, the wavelength starts to be greater than zero. The wavelength starts to be finite and measurable. So by the time you get to something as light as an electron, even if it's traveling near the speed of light, which electrons and atoms and molecules typically are traveling some low percentage of the of the speed of light, that gets you up into a range where the wavelength of an electron is about the wavelength of an x-ray. So that's a very non-trivial value. We can actually measure that. And in fact, this property that electrons have a wavelength similar to x-rays is used a lot in x-ray crystallography. So de Broglie was really on to something here. And those de Broglie waves, as I said, were used for electron interference in things like uh, X-ray crystallography. So let's apply this idea to the particular case of a hydrogen atom. So under the Bohr model of the atom, we have a situation where the hydrogen atom, or the, the electron, was some distance r away from the nucleus. It had some velocity vector perpendicular to the radius vector and it went around in a circle in a perfect circular motion. So in this case, the circumference of our particle here, or sorry, the circumference of our path is two pi times the radius it's traveling at. And in order for this wavelength to match up such that it doesn't interfere with itself, this, this has to be some kind of quantum of this circumference. So our wave wavelength has to be some positive integer times the distance around, otherwise this would interfere with itself. So I have a little graph here on Desmos, uh, links in the description of this particular idea. This red uh, line here is a single wavelength. The wave goes up, down, and back to the original. And we have some integer n, which I have set from anywhere from 1 up to 12. Every time you reach a complete wavelength, then you have another dot. So n equals 3, you complete three full wavelengths. So you can see as long as this n is some integer, you get a case where the wave is a standing wave, and it can exist on the circle, and the, the end meets up with the beginning, and everything is fine. So the wave doesn't interfere with itself or cancel itself out. It just keeps going no, no matter what it does. If you try to set this value to some non-integer value of, of your circumference, then you get problems. So if I say 9.5, see the wave overlaps with itself and it interferes with itself. That wave would cancel itself out. Even worse when it's more non-integer values. So anything that's an integer is good and behaves according to this hypothesis. But what happens here when we have 2 pi r equals n times lambda? Well, we have 2 pi r equals n lambda. Lambda equals h over p, so n lambda is n h over p. p is momentum is mass times velocity, so that's n h over m v. So you have, if we multiply uh, by both sides, divide by, 
and multiply both sides by m, divide both sides by 2 pi, we get that, or times mv. We get mvr equals nh over 2 pi. And notice that mvr is equal to the angular momentum in perfect circular motion, and h over 2 pi is equal to h bar. This gives us L equals N H bar. This is the exact hypothesis that Bohr used when he was doing uh, the Bohr model of the atom in order to solve our two equations, two unknowns for the velocity and the radius. So wave particle duality, the de Broglie hypothesis that the wavelength of particles is equal to Planck's constant over their momentum, led to the exact consequence that in order for the waves of an of a electron in a hydrogen atom to be stable, the Bohr frequency or the Bohr quantization condition for angular momentum had to be met. So all these ideas about the behavior of uh, light and matter and, and particles and waves, all these things seem to be coming together and painting a picture that agrees with, with one another that these particles do have wavelength, they have wave-like properties, they have quantized properties, that there's something going on with quantization and uh, quantum behavior at these very small scales.